All right. So uh, this is fluid mechanics. I'm going to be recording the lectures this semester. I've been doing that for the last couple of years, and students seem to like it. So I'll continue to do it. If you prefer not to have your voice on the internet, I guess you just have to whisper your questions. Uh, the microphone's not that sensitive, but it usually isn't an issue. Uh, we've just done that group activity, and I'll score that and put the grades on Island. Uh, no, I'm going to be in the habit of calling it iLearn because that's what it's uh, at the university I was at last year. It's called MU Online here. Uh, we'll be using the grade book this semester. Um, let's take a look at some announcements as we begin. Here is our textbook. I sent you an email maybe a week and a half ago about it, trying to save you some money. Because how much does it cost over at the bookstore? $321. I mean, you could fly to LA for that, right? Uh, 321 is a lot. By all means, go spend 321 if you like. And in fact, uh, that's the 11th edition for sale over in the bookstore. If you buy the 11th or this, the 10th, either is okay from the standpoint of reading the chapters and everything. There may be some discontinuities on the homework assignments, but if you do happen to get an 11th edition, I'm happy to help you work that out. I can give you the uh, correct homework sets if that becomes an issue. But much cheaper if you buy or rent the 10th edition. So how many people already have the textbook either with them or on order? Like it's all sorted out. Most people. All right. Well, if you haven't yet, I, uh, I think it's still available. I checked the other day and they must have plenty of copies because it was still available. Okay, so textbook, that's one thing that you need to have in the back of your mind. Another one is that there is an introductory assignment that you should complete on MU Online. And some of you, I think, are in my engineering economy class, and it's a very similar assignment. It's basically just kind of a getting to know you kind of a thing. Um, if you go to uh, I, MU Online, then uh, you'll find our course. It loads slow because they put that video on there. MU Online. All right. All right, so 318. And then you'll see the assignment in the uh, course content tab here. Um, introductory assignment. So five questions. If you click on the assignment, then it'll take you into the place where you can either type your submission here, or you can write it up in Word or whatever and upload it using this attach file, browse my computer, submit. So I think it should take you maybe 20 minutes to complete that first assignment. That is due by Thursday at 5 p.m. Don't print it out. Don't email it to me. Um, all right. So the next thing after homework one is homework 2A. And uh, that's the problem set. I'm going to be giving you a list of all of our homework assignments for the entire semester in just a moment, so that if you like to get a head start, you can. That's due on Tuesday the 30th, so that's a week from today. And it's due at the beginning of class. Uh, I would prefer it that you solve your homework assignments on engineering paper. And if you don't know what engineering paper is, I forgot to bring some. Oh, there's some engineering paper. Here's engineering paper. You can buy it at the bookstore. I don't think it's $321, but if it was, it would still be a bargain because that paper is the best. Um, you can photocopy it and the lines don't show. It makes all your friends and family feel like you're doing real work as an engineer. It's like a status symbol, basically, doing your assignment on that paper. So take full advantage of the fact that you're an engineer. Uh, you don't need to fold it. Just set it on the table before class. and. Uh, my intention is that uh, we should cover all of the topics before you do homework problems, but occasionally it may be the case that you'll have a homework problem that we didn't exactly get to an example that's the same as that problem. We only meet twice a week, and so in those cases, uh, you know, the book's a great resource, and there's almost always similar examples to the homework problems in the book. So most of them, I think, will cover in class, the concepts, and maybe even some supporting examples, but occasionally you'll be on your own. All right, let me hand out the syllabus and the schedule, and we can talk about that. 
Not everyone here has me for lab. Is that right? Some of you have already been to lab this week with Dr. Ford. All right. That requires a little bit of coordination because there's two different lecture teachers and then two different lab instructors. Um, we're going to be doing, I think, the same labs every week. So there won't be an issue with the uh, material being mixed up in that way. Here's the syllabus. Does everybody have a copy? We need maybe a couple more down here. Three. All right. Four more. Here you go. One more there. All right. You're welcome. Did everybody get a copy of the syllabus? One more? I may have to print that. I think I may not have printed all of them. I'll bring it up on the screen so that you can follow along. <clears throat> all right. So the syllabus, um, the introductory stuff here is my office location is here in this building in the engineering lab. 101. Uh, my phone number, email address is there. My office hours are five days a week. Um, so you can see that uh, on Tuesday, Thursday, which is the day we meet, it's after our class. Uh, if you have questions that you want to stop by my office and uh, outside of the office hours, I'm happy to help you if I'm available. Uh, if you need to make an appointment, you want to make sure I'm there outside of these, then just send me an email and we can definitely set something up. So you can see the course description, principles of hydrostatics, hydrodynamics, computer applications. It's pretty vague. It doesn't really give you much of an idea of what we're going to be doing this semester. Uh, here's the information for the text. The ISBN can be helpful in finding the uh, text if you're searching for it online. Now this list of outcomes gives you more of an idea of what we're going to be learning this semester, but I'll show you a course schedule that I think is even more instructive in just a minute. Let's jump to some of the policy stuff. The grading basis, um, you're going to be graded 50% on the basis of our two midterm exams, 19% on homework assignments, 6% on three quizzes that we'll have during the semester, and then the final exam is 25%. And then it's just sort of the standard grade breakdown uh, as far as these percentages and letter grades as most everything else. Uh, this schedule tells you the subject of each lecture and what textbook chapter is corresponding to each of those subjects. All right, the homework policy is important, and so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about this. Um, it's important that what you submit is your work, and it's not the result of group work. Uh, and the reason for that is I've seen the, the sort of thing when students, um, maybe three or four students, sit at a table and solve the homework at the same time. And the concern I would have with something like that is that everyone naturally works at a different pace. It's just like anything else. And so the students who naturally are maybe more methodical and work more slowly lose the chance to think through the problem and figure it out on them, their own if they're sitting with a group of other students who are zipping through it quickly. And so I think for the best learning experience, you should try and tackle the problem on your own. It's OK to talk about the problem with other students. It's OK to check your calculations and check final answers with them. And even if, if you think somebody has a mistake, it's OK to go through these problems and find out what the mistake is. But I'd like you to solve it on your own. Do the work yourself so that when you turn something in, it's what you worked on. It's not the author's solution manual, which I know the PDF of the author's solution manual is out there on the internet somewhere. And the, the problem with that is, obviously, it's going to steal your learning opportunities if you're accessing that. And uh, it's a pretty common thing that I'll scan through the homework assignments before I give them to the grader. And if me or the grader notices any similarities that make us think that there's been um, access of the author's solution manual or copying from it, then uh, what I'll try and do is uh, have you taken out of the course. That's how strongly I feel about it, is that uh, students who copy from the author's solution manual or other forms of cheating uh, need to retake the course a different semester. So uh, let me give you some more information about, for homework, what's OK and what's not OK. It's OK to talk about the homework problems with someone else, thus the smiley face. It's OK to check answers, 
help other students learn and find their mistakes, but it's not okay to show someone every step of a problem. You know, like if you tell them, first do this, then do that, if you go through a checklist of how to solve the problem, then the puzzle is spoiled for them. And you only get stronger if you go through the puzzle yourself. It's not okay to just give your assignment to someone else because you don't know um, if they're going to see every step or if they're going to copy it. And so I would encourage you to just hang on to your own work and you know, be there if they want to look at it briefly. Uh, but it's better just to talk about the concepts or maybe um, you know, look at their work and see if you can spot an error. And then I also explain that group working problems simultaneously, I think, is, uh, is a risky practice. There's benefits and disadvantages. I understand that you know, it's not just bad. It, it can be helpful to some students. But I think for this course, the disadvantages outweigh the benefits. And so I suggest that you begin your work alone and then collaborate once you've gotten started on it. Any questions about that? Any questions about the expectations as far as homework or avoiding inappropriate collaboration. There's a lot of academic policies and they're all available on the Academic Affairs website. I'm sure that each of you will spend most of this week reading through all the policies and becoming acquainted with the inclement weather policy. So uh, I'll direct you to those. Um, this next table is explaining how the course outcomes are practiced and assessed in the course just in case you wanted to know how you were going to be uh, evaluated on each of the learning objectives, then they're in the table there. All right. So I've been going through this a little bit quickly because I think that the, um, the schedule is maybe even more important to keep handy than the syllabus. So let me show you the schedule and I'll give you a printed copy. This schedule shows for each day what we're going to be doing in the lecture. And for those of you who are having the lab with me, it also shows uh, what labs we're covering each week. If you've got the lab with Dr. Ford, his schedule may be slightly different, and so you should probably just you know, cross off the, uh, the last column if you're in Dr. Ford's lab. Oh, let me get one more. I grab one out of that stack. Thanks. OK. We have lab, those of you in my lab section, we have lab tomorrow afternoon. Those of you who are with Dr. Ford, you had it on Monday, right? You've already been. All right, so this is showing for each week, the two days a week that we're meeting, uh, the date, the class number, the subject of our lecture, the corresponding book chapter, and then the homework assignment. So you can see that Thursday, the introductory assignment is due then Tuesday, homework 2A is due, and so on. It gets a little crowded towards the end. I think that's unfortunately the case in a lot of courses, that it kind of gets hectic towards the end. I've tried to spread it out as much as possible. Uh, we won't have a project in this course, for example. Um, I just prefer that we focus on the, the material itself, and so... Uh, if it helps with your planning, we, we know what we're going to do through, entire, through the entire semester. The midterm exams will be administered in class. And you'll notice that for those of you in uh, my lab section, we won't be having a lab during the week of the midterm exam. So any questions that pop out to you after glancing over the uh, schedule? Yeah. yeah. Is the final exam going to be like a comprehensive exam? Or just Good question. All right. Yes. The final exam is comprehensive with an emphasis on the material since the second midterm. So what that means is, let's say, for example, what if the exam was five questions long? What I would expect to give is three questions on the final that are from the stuff that you haven't been tested on, and then two questions from the earlier material. So it is comprehensive, but it's weighted more strongly on the later material. Are there other questions? Okay. Don't let the enormity of the semester intimidate you. I mean, it's a lot of stuff, but we've got plenty of time, and it's just a little bit at a time. If, if you put an hour a day into this class, then you'll sail through the semester. Okay. 
So the syllabus, the schedule, um, I think that's it as far as the, uh, the course introductory stuff goes. Any questions about these announcements? Oh, nope, there's one more thing I want to show you. The, uh, the notes. It seems like everyone has their own preference on how the notes are formatted. You know, some students want to have every slide on a separate page because they like to see everything big and, and printed out large. And so I have here, you can print out, if you prefer one slide per page, you can print out that PDF and uh, have it nice and big. If you prefer to take a little bit of notes and you want to do the uh, three slides per page, that's available. You can see what this looks like. So you can just download that PDF and print it out wherever you prefer in whatever format's best for you. I didn't do nine slides per page, but if anybody wants it, I will. Seems like at that point you're going to need a magnifying glass or something, but whatever. All right, so the notes are available. You don't have to have them. When I was in school, I always just took notes by hand. PowerPoint wasn't, when I was in school, it wasn't the scourge that it is now. Now it's this like unavoidable catastrophe that you just can't get away from. People reading their PowerPoints to you, right? It's, I don't, I don't understand it. I try and not read PowerPoints to you as much as I can, but anyways. All right, so we're going to be talking about fluid properties today. And um, we'll begin with some of the, the units that we'll use in the course. For the most part, your homework assignments and our examples will be in SI units. It just makes more sense for fluid mechanics for a lot of different reasons that you'll see as we work through it. But occasionally we will have some of our problems solved in the traditional units. And so, you know, in the SI system there are kilograms. When we are working in traditional units there are pounds of mass and slugs. More about that in just a moment. Meters. In traditional units there's feet, inches, yards, miles. So I was in a different country last year and when I would mention to them that there's 12 inches in a foot, people would just look at me with like a blank stare. They didn't understand why there would be th uh, three feet in a yard or 52, 80 feet in a mile. It's just a perplexing system. So, um, you know, the United States is unique in that I think it's the only industrialized country that still uses the British gravitational system. Luckily, time is the same, though. Imagine how weird that would be if we had a different, you know, seconds and different hours and all. Thankfully, that's the one thing that seems to be standardized. In force, a newton is the amount of force required to accelerate a, accelerate a kilogram at a rate of one meter per second squared. And the units of force are pounds force. And those are different than pounds mass. We'll discuss that in just a moment, the difference between pounds force and pounds mass. Now, although gravity does vary enough to be measured, over the surface of the Earth. For purpose of this course, we're always just going to use 9.81 meters per second squared. All right, so here's that slide that explains pounds mass versus pounds of force. Now, before we begin, let's remember that a Newton is the force required to accelerate a certain amount of mass by a certain acceleration rate. Okay, so a pound of force is a similar thing. It's the amount of force that has to be applied to a slug in order to get that slug of mass to accelerate one foot per second squared. So maybe you're asking, what's a slug? Which is a reasonable question. A slug is 32.2 pounds of mass. That's a strange number, but what does that number correspond to? Acceleration. It's acceleration. Right, so you may know that acceleration is 32.2 feet per second squared. And so what it works out to being is a pound of force is equal to a pound of mass when you are accelerating it at G. And so if I have a pound of gold in my hand, which would be awesome, if I had a pound of gold in my hand, then it would have a weight of one pound. It would be both a mass pound and a force pound, as long as here I am standing on Earth. But we can also think of it the other way around, that a pound of force is 32.2 pounds of mass, but accelerated not at g, but accelerated at 1 foot per second squared. So it's a little confusing. That's why we stick to SI for the most part. 
All right. Um, so the weight of a kilogram is 9.81 newtons. We do the same thing, multiply the mass by acceleration, and that gives you the force. In temperature, uh, for fluid mechanics, fluids include not only liquids, but also gases. And so some of the, some of the calculations that we're going to be doing are gas law type uh, problems. And you probably remember from chemistry, anybody remember the ideal gas law? That's right, PV equals NRT. So we're going to use that again in the coming classes. And when you're working with the gas laws, the temperatures should be in Kelvin. And so I'm sure most of you also remember this conversion factor of 273 to get from Celsius to Kelvin. Um, our units of work and energy are joules. And a joule is the amount of energy required to exert a newton of force across one, me one meter of distance. And so if I had that mass in my hand that I'm pushing upward a meter, then uh, you know, we could measure that effort in joules. And power is when we put a time component. It's the rate of energy being expended. So it's how many joules per second are being used. That's what we refer to as a watt. OK. so. Uh, in your book, it has a series of conversion factors here on the, the very front cover. Are, you know, I'm, I'm going to show you a few conversion factors, but everything you would ever need is on the front cover. And there's a lot of nice formulas on the, the facing page of that. But just for reference, a foot is about 30 centimeters. A slug is about 14 kilograms. Um, we can measure work in BG units as a foot pound. And the pound we're talking about there is a pound of force. So that's the same as 1.356 Newton meters. Uh, power is measured either in foot pounds per second or horsepower in traditional units. And the conversion between a horsepower and watts is shown there. One horsepower is 550 foot pounds per second for some reason. And uh, that's equal to 746 watts. OK, sometimes you'll need to convert between Fahrenheit degrees and Celsius degrees. And the size of a Fahrenheit degree is smaller than the size of a Celsius degree. Not only is there a difference in freezing point of water, but there's also a difference in the size of the degrees themselves. And so if, it, if the temperature goes up one degree Celsius, that means the temperature went up by more than one degree Fahrenheit. It went up by nine-fifths of the degree Fahrenheit. So water freezes at 32 Fahrenheit. Um, the thing that corresponds to Kelvin in the British gravitational system, traditional units, are called rakine. And rakine is you add 460 to Fahrenheit, and then that gives you the absolute temperature uh, uh, in the traditional units. So let's just do a very brief example here to illustrate. Um, it was 46 degrees Celsius in Dubai last Wednesday. I looked that up. And you know, for those of us who've never lived someplace Celsius, it's hard to know, is that a lot or a little? You know, 46 sounds cool and breezy at first glance, right? It was not a cool and breezy day in Dubai last Wednesday. So calculate, what is that temperature in Rakine? should be more than that. Let me just. All right. So the temperature conversion. If it's 46 degrees Celsius, the first thing we want to do is change those Celsius degrees into Fahrenheit degrees. And so it's 82.8 Fahrenheit uh, because each degree Celsius is nine-fifths of a degree Fahrenheit. And then we have to add 32 degrees Fahrenheit because the freezing point of water is zero Celsius, but it's 32 Fahrenheit. So it's 114.8 Fahrenheit. Oh, when you guys were saying 574, you were talking Rakine, not Fahrenheit. OK. Sorry. I was thinking in Fahrenheit. All right. So you take the 114.8 and you add 460, so it's 574 Rakine. So it was a warm day over there. All right.
Any questions about temperature conversion? All right, let's go over some other important properties. Now, till now, probably most of what we've been talking about is old news. You know, if you've taken physics before, maybe from chemistry. Um, but now we're going to start covering some new ground. Um, we're going to use density a lot. And density is defined as the mass of something divided by its unit volume. And uh, for instance, water has a density uh, at 10 degrees cel uh, Celsius, 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. And when you were doing your calculations, I think probably most people did the uh, one gram in one cubic centimeter, right? And that's, it's easy to remember, basically. Uh, that's at a certain temperature, though. The warmer water gets, the less dense water gets. Um, and of course, when it freezes, it also becomes less dense. Specific weight is a really important fluid property that's related to density. It's, it's similar in a lot of ways, but instead of being mass per volume, it's the weight of water per unit volume. So uh, the unit volume that we're talking about in SI is a cubic meter of it, because a, a meter is the standard unit of length. In the traditional units, it's a cubic foot is our standard unit of volume. And uh, what we do, you can see from the formula, to get gamma, specific weight, sometimes it's also called unit weight, you multiply G by the density of the fluid. And so 9810 newtons per cubic meter, you may say, well, 9810, that reminds me of 9.81. And you'd be right, because all we do to get that unit weight is multiply the fluid density of 1,000 by the uh, Earth's gravitation of 9.81. Sometimes I'll tell you a specific temperature in a homework problem or an example. And so if I say water at 80, 80 degrees Celsius, then you'd need to look up a different unit weight or a different density. But if no temperature is specified, use these as the default values. 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter for density and 9810 newtons per cubic meter for this specific weight. Um, compressibility is also a fluid property and it's something that allows us, it's one of the differentiation factors between liquids and gases because both are fluids but within the category of fluids are liquids and gases and so what do you know about the compressibility of water versus the compressibility of air? Water, water is difficult to compress. It's not that it's completely incompressible. It's a little bit compressible, not very. Uh, air is much more easily compressed. But that doesn't mean that water, just because water is incompressible, meaning that it takes really an enormous amount of pressure to begin compressing it, even though water is incompressible, that doesn't mean it's always going to have the same density because temperature changes will affect the density, and if you have salts dissolved in water, then that can affect the density as well. And uh, so if we're talking about seawater, then you'd use a different unit weight and a different density than fresh water. And it's actually important enough that in the case of um, like uh, ships that are carrying cargo, the way that they know how much freight they have on board is actually they send an inspector around the ship to measure how deeply the ship is sitting in the water. And as they do their calculations, they'll take a sample of the water to know what is the density so that they can know the volume of water displaced and then also the density of water displaced is needed to know how deeply laden the ship is. Okay, so related to specific weight is specific gravity. And it's easy to confuse the two because they both have the name specific in it. But don't make that mistake. I know you're better than that. You'll never make that mistake if you set your mind to it. It's a ratio of the unit weight or the density of a fluid relative to the unit weight or density of water. So let's say, for instance, if there's an oil that has a density of 800 kilograms per cubic meter, then what would be the specific gravity of that oil? It would be 800 
divided by 1,000, so the specific gravity would be 0.8. So anything that is more dense than water will have a specific gravity greater than 1. Anything that's less dense than water will have a specific gravity of less than 1. So mercury is one that we use a lot. And the SG of mercury, which is uh, abbreviated HG, oh, that's not a G. I'll learn my alphabet one of these days. SG of mercury is 13.56. And so what that means is that mercury, the density of mercury, is 13,560 kilograms per cubic meter. So that's really dense. Mercury is really dense. And its high density becomes useful to us in a lot of applications. We'll be talking about in, um, in chapter 3 how mercury is used to measure pressure because it's such a dense fluid. So any questions on this slide as we're talking about density, specific weight, specific gravity? All right. So I was referring to the fact that <clears throat> temperature changes will have an effect on fluid density. And uh, that table in your book is table A5. If a specific temperature is given in your problem statement, then you should refer to uh, table A5 to find out what's the actual density that you need to use. Otherwise, these standard values are fine. OK. So the last thing we're going to talk about today is what's called uh, elasticity. It's basically a measure of how compressible water is. Water is uh, it's not incompressible. It takes a lot of pressure to, com to compress water. Um, and the bulk modulus of elasticity will help us to understand how much water changes in volume relative to the pressure that's applied. And if you look at the formula here, what it breaks down to dp is a change in pressure and then dv divided by v where the v with the cross through it that means volume and the reason why we put the little cross through the v here is that sometimes we use the letter v to mean velocity and so we're trying to make it a little bit less confusing if the v means velocity or volume so the v with the cross through it is volume so back to the formula this bulk modulus of elasticity is a ratio. It says you have some fractional change in pressure that you're applying to a liquid, and then the change in volume relative to how much volume was there initially. And then the interpretation of the negative sign, that negative sign is there because the relationship is this. An increase in pressure will lead to a decrease in volume. And, and that makes sense, that if, if you have water in some sort of a chamber that you can pump extra air into to pressurize the chamber, adding more air is going to squeeze that water down into a smaller volume. It doesn't change a lot. The bulk modulus of elasticity for water is 2.2 times 10 to the ninth pascals. And a pascal, pascal is a newton per meter squared. It's a measure of pressure. And so a newton, of course, is force expressed over a square meter of area. So it requires really, really high pressures for a minuscule change in volume for the liquid. So here's another way to think about that same formula. A change in pressure relative to a uh, change in volume and um, what's changing when the volume changes is actually the density, if you think about it, because it's the amount of stuff, it's the amount of mass that's occupying a certain amount of space. So let's get our hands dirty with a little bit of a calculation, just to try this out, plug some things into the formula so it feels more familiar to us. Let's say that we start off with an initial volume of water, 50 liters. Initially open to the atmosphere, it has that volume of 50 liters. What will be this, the final volume uh, after we add a pressure of 5 megapascals? And so 
This is 5 times 10 to the 6th pascals. That's the pressure that we're applying. So use, as you do your calculation, use this as our bulk modulus of elasticity. Here is our initial volume. Here is the pressure that's applied. We need to find delta V and then apply that to the original volume to find the final volume. Our modulus, uh, is, the book modulus here is uh, just Pascal's because it's times 10 to the ninth. So I guess we could have said that that's 2.2 gigapascals, right? Isn't giga times 10 to the ninth? Yeah. All right. So um, 5 megapascals. Anybody know what the pressure of water that comes into your house is? I mean, since this is a new unit system, Pascal's, maybe, maybe you're not acquainted with how much pressure is a little versus a lot. Well, I don't actually know it too well in PSI. I know it in Pascal's. Uh, the typical water pressure inside a house is around 500 kilopascals. So 500 kilopascals, this is 10 times as much pressure, and that's just to get a tiny little change in water volume. So as you can see, that's kind of why they say that water is incompressible, is that for the range of pressures that we are likely to apply to water in ordinary circumstances, water isn't going to respond to those pressures that we apply to it. You know, this is a, a tiny fraction of the volume decreasing by 10 times as much pressure as we'd typically put into a municipal supply. Any other questions on this example? All right. Well, before I let you go, let's just take one final look at these announcements. So your first order of business, if you don't already have the textbook, is to get that. The introductory assignment you could probably have finished by uh, 25 minutes from now if you wanted to sit down and get it done. Uh, that's due Thursday at 5, and then a week from today will be the first real homework assignment, homework 2A. So uh, that's it. Have a good day, and I'll see you on Thursday.